hey, hey, everybody. Good evening. We're a little bit uh, tardy this evening, but uh, here we are. So thank you for joining me. And tonight we are going to look at one of the strangest parts of the Bible, the book of Revelation, the revelation of Yeshua to John. And uh, we're going to to see some very, very strange things. Now, this is a book that I can't even pretend uh, to understand. Uh, which is interesting because uh, in the very opening part of this uh, book, it tells us that we should read it. And at certain times, it says that we should understand it. Uh, in fact, including in Revelation chapter 13, which is where our focus is going to be this evening. Uh, and so it's, but it's a very, very interesting book. And there's many different interpretations of the book. And um, we'll, we'll end up talking uh, about a bunch of those. But before we uh, dive in there, I do want to make sure that you are aware that we make a a version of the Bible for free available to you in audio. And you can get along to freebibleaudiobook.com, which is the website you're looking at here now. And you can just click a link here and download the entire Bible in audio. Now, this is in uh, right now. It's in an audio book format. So you'll need to download this to your computer and then transfer it to your mobile device via the software that lets you do that, like uh, iTunes, for example, on iOS and a Mac. I will make this available in MP3 and other formats very soon. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of time, but what's available there can be used right now. And you'll find that when you bring this into something like uh, iBooks, or any other app, except for Audible, which no longer reads anything you've transferred to your phone, only their own stuff, Uh, you'll be able to play this, you'll be able to speed it up, you'll be able to bookmark things, it'll remember your plays. And it's all broken up into sections such as um, the works of Jesus. So we've got the Gospels plus Revelation as one grouping. And I've kind of done it this way because that's more the you know, the authorship, and, and kind of, it's more contextual that way. Uh, don't, I haven't seen anyone else do it that way. But So you get Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Revelation in one section, in one book, one audio book, basically. The whole Bible doesn't fit into one audio book. So I think there are seven portions, and you can download them all one click, uh, and then you transfer them to your device, find an audio book player if you don't already have one, and then they will all be available to you. And it's a fantastic modern translation. I'll tell you a little bit of the story of how this happened. I've been working with this Bible Society for about, I think, 18 years. Might be a little longer. Um, when I discovered their translation uh, early on, uh, I liked it a lot. It was a very, very accurate translation. And, you know, I use a whole variety. People are always asking me, well, what translation should I use? You should use a whole variety. You know, you should have three or four or five at least on hand. And one of the best ways to do that is with the Bible Reader app. And we'll be using the desktop version of that here in just a second to read the Bible. Uh, the mobile app is really amazing. Let me see if I can just uh, show you on my, my phone here. Um, they have a terrific, oh, it's green, so it kind of blocked it all out there. But they have a terrific app, and um, if you if you just search for Olive Tree, Olive Tree Bible Reader, uh, then you will uh, get the, uh, it's called Bible Study, actually, they changed the name some years ago, um, Olive Tree Bible Study. It's this little green icon, oh, it doesn't look green to you, it looks black because my chroma key is knocking out the green, but um, anyway, uh, I'll put a link to it below. Unfortunately, only on, on, oh, is it only on iOS? Actually, I know they released the Windows version of the desktop software some time ago. So it's possible that there is an Android version of, of the app. I, I haven't looked. Um, but I think it's the best Bible study app that's out there. And it was purchased by um, Zondervan. And then they just sold it back to uh, one of the original owners And that's good because he has a lot more passion for it than Zondervan had, which is a massive publisher. And they've got their own app out there as well. Uh, So get along here to freebibleaudiobook.com, download it for free, 
Uh, and you know what I really recommend is that you learn to listen to it at high speed, right? So I I ha- I play it back at super high speed, um, and it just depends on the device that you have. Let's see if I can. Uh, Is it playing through my headphones? I think so. Let me turn Bluetooth off. Why can't I? Oh, because I have the volume down. You can see I've been listening to Revelation. <laughs> now, you say, oh, I can't understand that. Well, it just takes a little bit of time. You speed it up by 50%, and then you speed it up by a little more, and a little more, and a little more. And what you'll find is it's actually far less distracting to listen at high speed because it really engages your brain. And when it's at a slow speed, which is, you know, I mean, if I was to give you a comparison of the speed. One is ruling now, and the other has not yet come. When he comes, he oh, must hang on. remain for a okay. little while. The beast that was and is no longer is the eighth king. So <laughs> I couldn't listen to that. <laughs> that would drive me batty. Uh, and it and it's distracting because your mind will wander. And when it's faster, you've got to really concentrate. So you'll find that you can tear through the Bible so fast. Um, and it, it's really a good thing. So freebibleaudiobook.com. Go download it. Bookmark the page. I will have it as uh, MP3 files for you to download in the next month or so. I just don't have a whole lot of time right now. But I will get it there. And I'm also looking at a way to embed a player on the website so that you can download, uh, so that you can just, not download, so you can just listen to it on the website. Uh, whoop, and, and that's me. Yeah, I talk slow too sometimes. You know, um, some people have complained about my, my studies being slow, and I, I intentionally slow down because I want people to understand what I'm saying. You, If you like to listen to things, I can't listen to myself at single speed. You know, I review my own recordings. Uh, and I do that all at double speed. So, you know, if you're listening to this on YouTube, then you can just double speed the the video you're watching right now, right? Because this will be uploaded to YouTube later. Uh, we don't do it live on YouTube, but you, it'll be there. And um, you might think, man, this guy talks slow. Well, then just hit the speed button and double speed it. And uh, you'll probably find that, uh, you know, some people need it slower. Some people just want to get through it. So, Whatever is, is good for you. Okay, so Revelation 13, the mark of the beast. Um, this is, you know, a chapter of the Bible that a lot of people are talking about right now. And why are they talking about it? They're talking about it because it seems to be very relevant to what is going on here today. Right? Um, this is the section that talks about the mark of the beast. It talks about other things too. So we're going to read through the chapter. And then we will um, expand this mind map and we will start to look at some of these connections. And you're going to be, uh, <laughs> I saw someone say, in Tennessee, I use half speed. That's kind of funny. Um, and you'll start to see that um, there's so much going on here. And if you're looking at this video and you're going, well, I, w- I want to see, you know, Israel's kind of nailed it on some other things so i want to hear what he has to say about this no i i haven't nailed this i can assure you uh i don't know if i ever will in fact the more i i i, I read or listen to the book of revelation I, the more confused i get uh it is a very very confusing book um if you think you have it nailed and you can understand all of this reach out to me and let me know <laughs> uh, i i think you know i think that'll be good um, but I don't think anyone really has a, a grasp on this. And I've, I've read so many different commentaries and everything that's here. And, you know, people are going to send me stuff and say, oh, you're wrong. It's such and such. And, you know, I've, I've already seen it. I've, I mean, I'm sure I've seen every possible thing that is out there. But by all means, send me stuff. So let's go over to the text itself. And we're going to read through this chapter. And then we're going to expand it in the mind map. I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had... Ten horns and seven heads and ten crowns. Let me just enlarge my window here so I can look up here. It's a little better for for you. Um, I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns, seven heads, and ten crowns on its horns. There were insulting names on its heads. The beast that I saw was like a leopard. 
Its feet were like bear's feet. Its mouth was like a lion's mouth. The serpent gave its power, kingdom, and far-reaching authority to the beast. Now, we're going to come back to all this, and we're just going to read over it for now, but there's a lot of commentary I want to make on this, so we'll come back. We'll be here for a little while. One of the beast's heads looked like it had a fatal wound, but its fatal wound was healed. All the people of the world were amazed and followed the beast. They worshipped the serpent because it gave authority to the beast. They also worshipped the beast and said, Who is like the beast? Who can fight a war with it? The beast was allowed to speak arrogant and insulting things. It was given authority to act for 42 months. It opened its mouth to insult God, to insult his name and his tent, those who are living in heaven. It was allowed to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. It was also given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. Everyone living on earth will worship it, everyone whose name is not written in the book of life. That book belongs to the Lamb who was slaughtered before the creation of the world. If anyone hears, let him listen. If anyone is taken prisoner, he must go to prison. If anyone is killed with a sword, with a sword he must be killed. In this situation, God's holy people need endurance and confidence. I saw another beast come from the earth, and it had two horns like a lamb. It talked like a serpent. The second beast uses all the authority of the first beast in its presence. The second beast makes the earth and those living on it worship the first beast, whose fatal wound was healed. The second beast performs spectacular signs. It even makes fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. It deceives those living on earth with the signs that it is allowed to do in front of the first beast. It tells those living on earth to make a statue for the beast who was wounded by a sword and yet lived. The second beast was allowed to put breath into the statue of the first beast. Then the statue of the first beast could talk and put to death whoever would not worship it. The second beast forces all people, important and unimportant people, rich and poor people, free people and slaves, to be branded on their right hands or on their foreheads. It does this so that no one may buy or sell unless he has the brand, which is the beast's name or the number of its name. In this situation, wisdom is needed. Let the person who has insight figure out the number of the beast, because it is a human number. The beast's number is 666. Now, this is by no means the most confusing chapter in the book of Revelation. In fact, this is one of the, the most easily understood, in fact. Um, some of them are just so far out there, nobody really knows what to make of them. Um, but now, let's start on this mind map, and we'll start to unpack some of these different sections so we can kind of get an idea. Uh, I posted this a few months ago, and um, but tonight we're going to, to go through uh, some of these areas. And, and take a look at what's really going on here and kind of a, an interesting mind map. I've never done one like this before. I'm sure you're going to like this. So we're going to look at some of these things. The first beast, the dragon, the followers of Yeshua, the second beast, the statue of the first beast, the mark of the beast, and the world. And what does all this mean? Now, if you've listened to my uh, talk, Two Gardens and a Snake, which you absolutely must, uh, you might be thinking, wait, hmm, this is interesting. The serpent, right? If we go back here, the serpent. Um, the serpent gave its power, kingdom, and far-reaching authority to the beast. And you're going, wait, isn't, isn't this the serpent that's in the, the garden? Certainly seems that way. Now, not all translations translate it as serpent. Um, in fact, most don't. Most translate it as dragon. And uh, let's see if we can... I'm not sure why you're not giving me the option to... What's going on there? It's not giving me the option to change books. Oh, okay, great. So what we'll find here um, is that sometimes it's uh, translated serpent. I don't know why you jumped down to chapter 10 there. Um, whoops. Way, 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 way past. And then other times it'll translate it as, as dragon. Um, so here... Uh, Mm -mm -mm -mm. 
uh, here we go, and they worship the dragon. All right, so here it's translated as dragon instead of serpent. And uh, you, uh, here it is again, and, and the dragon gave him his power, authority, and, and great kingdom. So it doesn't translate it as serpent at all. It's translated here as dragon and great dragon. And this is the American Standard Version, and this is a fantastic translation, by the way. Um, so you'll find the most common way of translating it is actually dragon. The word is dracon, and it is to be translated as dragon. And the dragon has no resemblance to the serpent in the garden. Now, the reason it's translated this way in some translations, including my favorite translation, but every translation has translation errors and the bias of the translators comes through. Um, the reason it's translated as serpent is because Christians believe the serpent in the garden is Satan. And that's who we're talking about here. And so they, because they made a mistake about the identity of the snake in the garden, and now we're talking about this dragon. They go, well, dragon? What are we talking about a dragon for? No, it must mean the serpent. Oh, and so they translate it as serpent. And they, they talk about the great serpent of old instead of the great dragon of old. The dragon is very different to the serpent. So um, that's why when we we're talking before, you know, I said people ask me what translation should I use. You should use a variety. I have my favorite translation, you know, the God's Word translation. Um, and, and that's my kind of go-to reader. Uh, but, you know, if I was starting out in the text, then I would want to be comparing multiple translations all the time. If you're a new reader to the text and you come across a, a passage be really careful about not forming an opinion on it until you, like if it's something quite significant, about forming an opinion until you've compared it to several other translations. Every translation has really strong translator bias. All right? So this is really, really important. So let's go back to the mind map. And what we're going to do here is we're going to pop all of these open. Oops. I pressed the wrong button there, obviously. and pop that open and you can see oh look at that got quite something quite interesting here so i've broken down the book of revelation into this one mind map and we start to to look at all the different things that are here so let's let's start off with uh with the first beast and this is going to be extremely helpful um to to start to make sense of what's really going on here so the first beast right rises out of the sea the beast has an appearance. The beast is, first of all, it's, it's, it's a beast, and it's like a leopard, a bear, and like a lion. Now, those that have looked at some of my other studies go, oh, well, we know who that's talking about. Yes, we'll get to that in a little minute. Um, we know that it has 10 horns and 10 diadems or crowns on those 10 horns. We know that it has seven heads, that it speaks blasphemous names. And that one of these seven heads is mortally wounded but survives. We see that it's given a mouth to speak. And it speaks haughty and blasphemous words against God. And also against God's home, Nibiru. Um, now, if you're like, Nibiru, what's that? Well, you, <laughs> if you're new here, then you have to watch some of my other things. You're like, what's Nibiru? I've never heard that before. Yes. And I'm just going to have to, you know, we, we can't, we can't, kind of hold everything back we have to start letting everything out and those of you that are new and you're you're looking at these things and wondering well, what on earth is that you're just going to have to kind of catch up go through the videos on my youtube channel um all of them and you'll start to understand what these things are but heaven is actually a planet and i know it sounds a little sci-fi but heaven is actually a planet and that planet is called nibiru um the first beast let me just turn notifications off uh, goes to war against the saints. It is given power for 42 months. So that's the beast. Now let's look at the dragon. Um, we see that the dragon gives his power and great authority to the first beast. Right? 
Um, we can see here from this line, I've put these lines in, goes to war against the saints. So who are the saints? The saints are the followers of Yeshua. Then we have the second beast. And the second beast rises out of the earth versus rising out of the sea. Uh, its appearance is it has two horns like a lamb and it speaks like the dragon. It assumes the authority in the first beast's presence. It makes the world worship the first beast. It performs miraculous signs. It makes fire come from the sky. It tells the world to build a statue for the first beast and gives the statue power to speak. It causes those that refuse to worship the first beast to be killed and causes everyone, regardless of who they are, to be marked. Now, the statue of the first beast is quite interesting. You know, to me it sounds like a cyborg. It sounds like something we don't quite have yet technologically, but we are right on the cusp of developing. What is a statue? If you were watching this thing play out and you were John in the first century, and you know, you're you're seeing this image and you're trying to put it into a common understanding and and you see this robot that can actually talk to people like RoboCop or something. Uh, how would you describe it? Like a statue, because it's not a human, but it's like this metal and it's a statue, but the statue can speak, which is quite odd. How can a statue speak? So it's just conjecture on my part, but I, I think that's a fairly reasonable uh, interpretation of what it might be. Um, and we are absolutely, a, you've probably seen that viral clip of those uh, robots that are going around right now dancing and, and so forth. And, you know, you could mistake it for computer generated imagery, but it's actually real. And the, the ability of, of robots are just, I mean, every year their, their progress is, is just stunning. And so we have a statue that has the ability to speak. I would say there's there's a chance at least that we're talking here about some kind of a a robot. Perhaps a cyborg, but definitely some kind of robotic thing. I think it's possible. We've got the mark of the beast. Um, it's a physical mark. It's going to be on our right hand or on our forehead. There'll be no ability to transact without it. And it represents somehow the name of the beast or the beast's number, which is 666. So just in going through this, you know, I mean, I can see from the comments, people are like, well, this is very interesting. And all we're doing is kind of breaking it down a little bit, right? There's an awful lot that could be said about this chapter and so many others. And we'll talk about the mark of the beast. We'll come back to this because I, I definitely have a lot to say about uh, some parts of this. Um, and so then we have over here the world, right? And the world follows the beast, is marveled by the beast, worships the dragon, says, who is like the beast and who can fight against it? The world are the people that are not in Yeshua's book of life, in the Lamb's book of life. The world builds the statue to the first beast, and the world worships the statue of the beast. Now, you might say, well, I think this is all just metaphoric. Oh, yes, it might be. Look, I, as I said in the beginning, I, I am by no means an expert on this. There are people that have dedicated their whole lives to this. You know, I've dedicated my whole life to Yeshua. But um, I'm spending more time now. When I was a baby Christian, my first destination was this book. And I spent a lot of my early Christian years uh, in this book. But, but you know, my focus quickly became all about Jesus. And so now I'm kind of returning to it. It's like, okay, well, let's, 
it looks like at least what we're reading right here is what is about to happen. Maybe not. Maybe it's a thousand years away. But it doesn't seem so. It doesn't seem so. So, uh, this PDF I've made available before, and I will make it, I mean, this mind map um, I've made available before, and you will be able to get access to this after the video. So, you'll see a link somewhere connected to this video. Um, hopefully, just this in and of itself uh, is going to be, uh, you know, something for you to start getting stuck in there and making sense of what's in the text. Now, Let's focus on a couple of things. I'm going to start with the mark of the beast. This mark of the beast, you know, a lot of people say it's a lot of different kind kind of things. Um, I would say I, I know exactly what it is. And if, it's probably the only thing maybe in the entire book of Revelation that I, I think I understand. And the reason that I think I understand it is because th this is a repeat. What, what they're talking about here has happened before. This is not something new. Uh, we've seen, we've seen Yahweh in the Old Testament. We've seen him take a census of the people, and the wording that's used in the Hebrew seems to suggest a brand on their hand. But we've also seen the ancient marketplaces that are dedicated to a local deity, and what would happen is you would enter the marketplace. And right next to the entrance would be, or before the entrance even, would be an idol. And the idol would represent the local deity. And there'd be an attendant there who would take your money, and you'd be paying for some incense that you would then light at the altar to this god. Once you had done that, the attendant would get a stamp and stamp you on your hand. And you had the stamp on your hand. And now you could enter the marketplace and transact. You could buy or sell. This went on in the ancient world all the time. So when we look at this, people think, oh, well, it's a vaccine or it's a, a credit card. Or, you know, people back in the 70s used to think it was a bank card. You know, they, they used a B, which is like a six. And uh, uh, it, was, it was in three different colors. And so they could see it's 666. Uh, and all of these might kind of be echoes um, of what's going to happen. But I am convinced that we're going to see precisely the same thing that we saw before. An acceptance of the God of this world, of these, this cult system um, that the Bible calls the world, and we will be branded on our hand with something. It will probably be invisible to the naked eye. It will definitely be visible um, to your phone camera because these will be used uh, as ways of scanning it and it's probably going to use some infrared ink uh, that can be scanned quite easily and so your wallet your credit cards and your driver's license and everything will be consolidated into your own barcode probably something more like a, a, a QR code of sorts that will be tattooed by a very simple process, you know, I'm sure you'll just, you'll, you'll put your hand into a machine and using probably a laser perhaps or uh, some kind of technology, um, you know, it, it might blast ink into your skin. It's going to do something that's going to leave a physical mark, perhaps not visible, but physical, right? In other words, there is going to be a physical material change to your skin. And this will be the replacement for everything. Uh, we can kind of see precursors of this right now. They're talking about vaccine passports, vaccine certificates. And, you know, right now I've, I've seen several photos of people that have been issued a COVID-19 vaccine certificate. But you see, these are just pieces of cardboard with a doctor's signature on it, and there's nothing very special about them. Well, anybody could forge that. Very, very easy to forge that. So you roll out a system that's easy to take advantage of and everybody accepts it. Well, you're carrying around this little card in your wallet now and here it is. Um, they'll probably upgrade it to something more like a license and then it will end up being probably part of your driver's license. And 
and then because of the forgeries that will exist, um, you know, even very advanced forgeries, like, you know, you, we've seen before this uh, presidential election, the reports of these Chinese driver's licenses coming into the United States that work. They can be scanned. I mean, they're functional driver's license, and somehow they've, they've been able to, you know, either get in the back end of the system and input this data or do something. But the, the forgeries can be quite sophisticated. And the argument will simply be that because of the, the sophistication of the forgeries, we need to move to a foolproof system. And that means that everyone gets their own brand on their hand. Um, all the technology to do this is really here. It's been here for quite some time. And I suspect that we're going to see this rolled out. I would say pretty soon. Uh, you know, some of these people that are pushing the whole vaccine passport thing uh, are quite serious. You know, Qantas Airlines in Australia, um, they've already said that you cannot fly unless you have proof of vaccination. Okay, well, that's a... Qantas rules one of the major air routes between here and the South Pacific. So... You know, although you can still get around, it's going to be a lot more complicated if you can no longer fly with Qantas. If you want to fly to Australia or New Zealand and you don't want to fly with Qantas, well, Air New Zealand goes there, Fiji Islands goes there, Lufthansa goes there, and, you know, there's a few other smaller airlines. Um, but what happens when Lufthansa, uh, you know, says, well, we're, we're also going to require, and, and Air New Zealand says, well, we're going to require, and, and so on and so forth, and suddenly you're landlocked. Suddenly you can't board a flight to anywhere. You see, the way they're going to force you to do that is, is, is really quite insidious. So let's go back um, to the text here. Let me just change this back to um, uh, the God's Word translation. And you see here, the second beast forces all people, important and unimportant people, rich and poor, free people and slaves, to be branded on their right hands or on their foreheads. It does this so that no man can buy or sell unless he has the brand, which is the beast's name or the number of its name. So, you know, I've been involved in libertarian politics a long time, and Many of my libertarian friends think that, well, if it's not the government doing it, they have a right to do it. Well, as we're starting to see from everything that's going on, um, you know, you, you're, you're just going to be in a lot of trouble if you think that government is the only entity that can oppress and tyrannize the people. And, you know, people say, well, you know, build your own apple. <laughs> Yes, that, that's not as easy as, as said. Well, build your own internet. Okay, well, you know, we'll build your own economy. Build your own country. Build your own planet. And, you know, eventually the argument breaks down. There's no government involved here. The Australian government isn't forcing Queensland, uh, Qantas, Queensland, what does it stand for? Queensland and Northern Territory Air Service. Um the Australian government isn't forcing Qantas to create a rule that you have to be vaccinated to fly on their airline. They're doing it. Private enterprise is doing it. And so, you know, someone in the comments said, well, there'll be more business with smaller airlines. And the larger airlines won't do business with the smaller airlines that have carried unvaccinated passengers in their planes. And so it's a domino effect. Qantas was the first, but soon it's going to be all of them. And then how do you get around? You can't drive everywhere in the world. You know, you're going to get on a boat. <laughs> Boats are quite slow. And so, you know, almost everyone's going to buckle. You know, um, someone said to me the other day, because, you know, I, I kind of had to compromise and I, I bought one of these pretend masks so that I can still shop at Costco and they don't care because the staff at Costco 
actually think their own policies are completely absurd. So, um, you know, but I can't wear this on, on my frontier flight on Tuesday to DC. So I'm flying to DC on Tuesday and frontier has in their re regulations specifically no mesh masks. Can't wear it. Have to wear a real mask. Don't like it. Don't fly. Or you don't like going to Costco wearing it. Well, then go somewhere else. Okay. And then what happens when all the supermarkets say you must wear a mask or you simply can't come in? We're going to have to wear a mask. And you see, this process that we read about here in the text is happening in real time. They are shutting us all down. They are preventing our ability to transact unless we're wearing a mask. So what happens? What happens next? Someone says, well, you have to fight Israel and refuse. And what? Starve? What happens when no one is selling food? I mean, they destroyed all the small businesses so that only the bigger businesses remain. Oh, that would be necessary for this. Because otherwise the small businesses wouldn't care. They just keep, no, we don't care about all that stuff. Come in and buy. Don't need a mask. Don't need a mark. Right. So you destroy all the small businesses so you've only got these massive conglomerates left and all of these massive conglomerates tow the party line. And so what, what do you do? So we're being corralled into a corner here. Right now they're saying, well, you have to wear a mask or you can't come in. And what happens when they say, you have to have a mark or you can't come in? Well, first they'll say, well, you know, you, you have to have the vaccine certificate or you can't come in. And so then there'll be a massive uh, black market on fake vaccine certificates. Okay, so you get into the supermarket again for the next six months. But then they say, well, now you need a, a digital pass on your phone with a, a live updating QR code. And so, you know, every 10 seconds, the code changes in real time. You have a special app with a special code that is always constantly updating. There's already stuff like this, right? Um, you know, even on uh, T-Mobile Tuesdays, I don't, I don't use it anymore because it used to be very good. They used to have real things that you'd get for free by turning up with your phone and letting the retailer scan a code on your phone. You get like a free hamburger or something. Well, they don't, they don't have nice offers anymore, so I haven't touched it for more than a year. But you know, the, the code to scan would just be constantly updating. And so that'll come along. And what then? Well, <laughs> at that point, you, you're going to have to have an incredible level of sophistication to recreate something that's going to work when you walk into the supermarket and they want to scan your constantly updating code on your phone. But then some people will do it and there'll be these apps that'll be going around that'll, that'll give you a forged certificate so you can get in and shop. And then they'll say, well, because of the sophistication of the forgeries, we have to move to a far more resolute solution. And that is that everyone's going to get a permanent code on their hand. We are not very far away from this. Not a decade away. We might be just two or three years away from it. Government ha doesn't have to do any of this. The free market is doing this. We need to really be wise and wake up really fast. Whatever you do, do not accept this mark. Everyone is about to be talking about this system. Everyone's going to know about it. And you're going to find that 
the vast majority of people are just going to go along and they're going to call people like me and you or anyone that, you know, thinks this is from the biblical text and this is a bad thing. Well, they're going to call you a ridiculous person. They're going to call you a lunatic. They're going to call you a ludite. They're going to, they're going to call you a nutcase. And they're going to tell you that everybody is getting this because that's the right thing to do. You don't want to be a part of the, the new normal, the new society. The peer pressure is going to be exorbitant. People are going to be getting the mark on their hand and they're going to be showing it off to their friends. They're going to want to be first in line. March 1st, 2024, the mark becomes available and people are going to be there with their, you know, their phones. Got the mark. Yeah, I was the first in my town to get the mark. Yeah. All the famous musicians and, you know, rock stars, Hollywood actors and great personalities and, you know, social commentators and social media personalities uh, all of these people are, are going to be showing off on their Instagram. Look what I got. I got the mark before you did. You can see this, right? This is going to be impossible to escape. People are going to be escaping to the mountains into the countryside and living on the land and that'll work for a little while. But then how do you buy gasoline? Because the pumps will, will have the, the scanners installed on them and they will want to scan your mark. And what do you do when you want gas? You can't travel anymore. You can't heat your home in the winter. Then the utility companies uh, are going to say you must be able to provide a scan on your hand to show that you're in the system or we can't sell you electricity anymore. So there's going to be a few people that have successfully gotten off grid that might be able to survive for a little longer. But if you're in a city, you're, you're going to, uh, to die of starvation. Now there's going to be kind people that are going to give you food and things and, and, you know, do black market exchanges with you but that's not going to last forever they will criminalize that behavior you can't give food to somebody that doesn't have the mark no you can't do that and the you know the the food banks they're going to have to start requiring the mark you say well there'll be resistance of course there'll be resistance but there won't be enough not if what is written here in the text is real. Not if this is genuine and it's really going to happen. There's not going to be any escape. They're going to brand us. Yahweh is going to brand us like he's branded people in the past. And the only thing we'll be able to do is either move out of the cities escape and try to live off the land and be completely off-grid. But that's only going to last a little while. They'll come for us. And eventually they're going to require us to have the mark. Now it says, the second beast forces all people. Right? How does it force all people? They don't need to put a gun to your head. Verse 17 it does this so that no one may buy or sell unless he has the brand. You're just screwed. Like there's nothing you can do. The, the, no government is necessary. The market is going to force you to do this. So libertarians, you need to really put your thinking cap on right now. We're between a rock and a hard place. Now, you know, a question might be, well, do you think this is really true? That this is all really going to happen? I don't know. I'm not a prophet. I'm not saying this is all true and real. I teach from the text, but maybe this is just fiction. Maybe this is a thousand, two thousand, five thousand years away. 
But does it feel like it? Does it feel like it's fiction? Does it feel like it's a thousand years away? Or does it feel like they're creating this whole system right in front of our eyes right now? That's how it feels to me. I would be in denial if I said, no, they're not doing any of this. Are you kidding me? Seriously? Actually, I just thought I have an example of a barcode like I was showing you. The Whole Foods app. That has uh, one of those dynamic barcodes. So, no, I don't want notifications on. So here, Whole Foods, right? So there's a barcode right here. But if I just hold my phone up to the camera long enough, you'll see that the barcode will change. It's a dynamic barcode. I don't know how long it changed. There you go. So you just saw it change. Right? So it's about 10 seconds, 15 seconds. And every so often, the barcode will change. How do you create um, a fake of that? How do you do it? It's changing on your phone, and it's changing on their back end. So they can verify that's you. Right? That's how you, you let them know at Whole Foods that you're a Prime member. And so you can get your Prime discounts. So that will be the vaccine certificate. But people will forge it. People will somehow hack into it. And so they can, they can get away with it for a little while. And then they'll say, okay, well, because of these great hackers and the amazing uh, sophistication of their, their forgeries, well, now we have to have something that is far harder to, to fake and is indelible and is on your skin. And if you don't have a hand, no problem. You're an amputee, no problem. We'll stick it on your forehead. This is uh, probably what we're walking into right now. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't have some revelation from God or anything like that. But I'm just looking at this going, wait, what it's talking about here. Like, this is what we are seeing unfolding right in front of our eyes. We would be the lunatic to deny this. Now, other people on the other side would say, you're the lunatic. You think, oh, that's true. Are you kidding me? Do you not have some of these? Look around you. Look at what's happening. So I think this is a very worrisome time in our history, in human history. And if this is happening, what else? That this book, not just the revelation of Yeshua to John, but all the rest of it, what else that it talks about is also real? What else is true? You know, I... um. We'll come back to this, but I, I want to kind of interrupt that and show you uh, another mind map. Let's put this up on the screen here, because I don't think there's anything more important than, than this. There's nothing whatsoever that's, uh, hang on a second, that is more important than being able to recognize the voice of Yeshua. Right? Doesn't matter what your interpretation of the Bible is. Doesn't matter what, what your beliefs, religious or secular or otherwise, are. I encourage you to do this one thing. Not to become a Christian. I'm not a Christian. I'm a former Christian, right? Um, but this is the single most important thing you can do in your whole life. To recognize the voice of Yeshua. And for, for new people, you haven't heard the word Yeshua before. You know, it's simply the Hebrew word for Jesus. It's his real name, right? Nothing weird about it. Nothing that esoteric about it. In 2021, this is the single most important thing you can do to prepare yourself for what's next. Read these books in the Bible. John, Luke, Matthew, and Mark. These are the Gospels, right? And answer the following five questions. 
What did Yeshua say about himself? What did Yeshua say about his father? What did Yeshua say about where he came from? What did Yeshua say about what he came to do? And what did Yeshua say would happen in the future? There's nothing more important than this for you right now. Now you say, well, I've been a Christian all my life. Great, then do this. Because you'll learn more about Yeshua in a couple of weeks, going through the Gospels and answering these, you know, having these questions in mind as you read. Notice these are all neutral questions. None of these questions are about doctrine or beliefs or anything. Right? They're simple, neutral questions. What did Yeshua say about himself, his father, where he came from, what he came to do, and what would soon happen? I'm not leading the witness in any way. You know, after a whole life of studying Jesus, these are the five questions I came up with to guide everybody, whether you've been a Christian for 50 years or whether you're, you're, you think this is, Christianity is a load of nonsense. And it, well, it, it kind of is. It's, that's why I'm not a Christian anymore. But Yeshua isn't Christianity. And there's, there's, there's got to be a separation there. You've got to understand that there's a big difference. So grab a Bible and you can do it online and you can go through these Gospels and with these five questions in mind, and it will completely blow your mind. What you will learn about Jesus will blow your mind. And I encourage you to watch all of the videos I've done so far on my YouTube channel, and there'll be more there almost every week. Now, we should talk about who is this beast, right? This beast is really important, actually. The beast in Revelation. Because the identification of the beast is is really just quite something. Um, who is the beast? Let's see if I can find the mind map I want. I did. Okay, great. So, let's... Um, Let's look at this. This is going to be quite surprising if you've not seen any of this before. If you've seen my other studies like, um, you know, two gardens and a snake, then, you know, this will be a little bit more familiar to you. But let's go back to the text and let's, uh, let's go back to the beginning of Revelation 13. And we see the description here of this beast. Now, remember, if you're, if you're new and there's, there's, there's more people here now than when we started, this serpent here is a, is the word dracon. It's supposed to be translated dragon, not serpent. This is not the serpent in the garden. And you can watch my study, Two Gardens and a Snake, uh, for a more thorough explanation of why we know that. But this beast, the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like bear's feet. Its mouth was like a lion's mouth. That's interesting. So here Yeshua is giving us a description of the beast. This beast that is going to be the beast the whole world worships. The false god. And we have a very plain, clear description of this beast. Wow. This beast is not who you think it is. If I was to, to ask you, well, who do you think the beast is? You'd probably go, Satan, I'm guessing. Yeah, it's Satan, but... But if we were to look at you know some of the main characters in the Bible, because Satan's hardly ever mentioned, um, do you think that it might relate to anybody, anything? So if you're new here, this will be a little shocking, but we're just going to dive into it instead of keeping you in suspense. Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, is the God of this world. He is the beast. Now, that might sound completely extraordinary, but we're about to, uh, to look at that right now. So who is Yahweh? Yahweh is the beast, and the text plainly calls Yahweh Satan, the Hasatan, the adversary of humankind. So let's start here. The beast, he is known as the god of this world, and in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, also known as Satan, the adversary, the devil, and the beast in Revelation 13. 
Now, before you, you go, what on earth? Yeah, I'm, I'm out of here. No, just wait a few minutes. Be curious. Because the Bible's really, really, really clear. And we've been lied to, and this is one of the main reasons I'm not a Christian. Because Christianity teaches us that Satan is God. No, he's not. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. Revelation 13, 2. Yeshua describes the beast. The beast is like a leopard, a lion, and a bear. And then we go to Yahweh describing himself in Hosea chapter 13. And he says, But I am the Lord your God from the land of Egypt. You knew no God but me, and beside me there is no Savior. So I am to them, to Israel, like a lion. Like a leopard, I will lurk beside the way. I will fall upon them like a bear robbed of her cubs. I will tear open their breast, and there I will devour them like a lion, as a wild beast would rip them open. So Yahweh lies about being the only Savior. Yeshua is the Savior. Yeshua is the one who laid down his life for all of humanity. And then Yahweh describes himself in Hosea 13 the exact way that Yeshua describes the beast in Revelation 13. But there's no mistake here. Now, if it was just two of these things that lined up, you go, well, that's, that's kind of interesting. If it was three, you'd be like, whoa. Okay, but we have four. And so we're stretching the realms of impossibility now. Yeshua is being crystal clear that the beast in Revelation he is describing is Yahweh. Now, I've never been against Yahweh in my life. This was something that I worked out some years ago, and I sat on it for a long, long, long time because I didn't want to say anything to anyone. I mean, this would, this would tarnish my reputation the rest of my life, and, and it is. But it's right in the text. And it's things like this, and there's so many other things that we've talked about in our studies that Christianity has no knowledge of. The big story that brackets every single last thing in the Bible. That we're living between the two gardens of the trees of life. And Christianity doesn't even talk about what's going on there. doesn't even mention it. But then it gets worse. Here is a verse in John 8.44 that so many scholars and theologians have tried to make these elaborate arguments for. No, it's not, it's not talking about Yahweh, it's talking about Satan. Yes, yes, they're one and the same. Um, you are of your father, this is John 8, 44. You, he's talking to the Jews. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from Genesis, the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. I encourage you to read the whole book, a uh, whole chapter at least of, of John chapter 8. You'll see that in verse 41, it absolutely clarifies who we are talking about. In fact, maybe we should just pop over there and, and take a look at it, okay? Because some people will go, oh, no, I don't know about that. Okay, that's fine. I, look, it's, you've got to be curious. Doubt is wonderful, but so is curiosity. So here, the, the Jews replied to Jesus, Abraham is our father, verse 39. Jesus told them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do what Abraham did. I am a man who has told you the truth about what, that, that I heard from God, but now you want to kill me. Abraham wouldn't have done that. You're doing what your father does. The Jews said to Jesus, this is verse 41, John chapter 8, verse 41, we're not illegitimate children like 
Hugh, Joseph, Mary, the whole thing that went on there. God is our only father. Okay, so we're talking about Hyotevai, Yahweh, the God of the Exodus, the God of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the God of Torah. We're not illegitimate children. God is our only father. Jesus told them, if God were your father, you would love me. But he makes it so clear. You came from your father, the devil, and you desire to do what your father wants you to do. The devil was a murderer from the beginning. He has never been truthful. He doesn't know what the truth is. Whenever he tells a lie, he's doing what comes naturally to him. He's a liar and the father of lies. You see, we've lost about 20 people as we started to get into this. This is very hard to accept. But there's so much in the text that proves this. It's, it's just never ending. So let's look at a little more. Because you're like, oh gee, I don't know about that. You've just got a few verses. No, we don't. We have so much, it's not funny. So, let's see here. The text plainly calls Yahweh Satan. The numbering of Israel. Remember how I told you that Yahweh before had numbered all of the people, that he'd given all the people this brand. So what's going to happen in Revelation 13 has already happened in other forms before us. So the numbering of Israel, the same event, is recorded twice in the Bible. One time Yahweh incites David, the other time the adversary Satan incites David. Here in 2 Samuel 24 it says, Again the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go number Israel and Judah. The exact identical story, no scholar disagrees, it is exactly the same story. In 1 Chronicles 21 it says, Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. And you can go and look these up and you will see from the stories they are exactly the same chronological event. And no one disputes this. There's no dispute about that at all. This is the first time the word adversary was used in the entire biblical text. First Chronicles chapter 21. Ha Satan, the adversary of humankind. What's it doing there? Why is it like that? Now, there's so much I can show you, but I'm just going to show you one little thing because this will be easy to remember. The book of Jude is a very short book and there's a mysterious passage there that's never made sense to anybody. People have really scratched their heads over this. But now it makes sense. And it only makes sense from this context that Yahweh is the adversary. Yahweh killed so many people in the Old Testament. He's the one that wanted to wipe all the humans out in the flood. And you say, well, didn't he go to Noah? It wasn't Yahweh that went to Noah. It was Yeshua that went to Noah. And here in Jude, this is so interesting. Look at the, the highlighted part here, verse 9 of, of the book of Jude. This is right before the book of Revelation. When the archangel Michael argued with the devil, they were arguing over the body of Moses. What? Now, how well do you know your Old Testament? What's the story with, with Yahweh and Moses? So, Yahweh and Moses trot off up a hill. And Yahweh shows Moses the promised land. This is where everyone's going to enter except for you. In fact, you're going to die right here. And Moses died, and Yahweh buried him there. So, wait, Michael was arguing with the devil over the body of Moses, but 
if Yahweh's God, what what is God's supposed archangel Michael doing arguing over the body with the devil? What's what's going on there? How does that make any sense? Is not from the Christian perspective, is it not true that the archangel Michael is the exclusive archangel of Yahweh according to Christianity? Well then how can this possibly be? What suddenly Yahweh forgot where he buried Moses? Why is he now arguing over the devil with the body? He's the only person, Yahweh is the only person that knows where Moses is buried. How does this make any sense at all? And why does Michael refuse to rebuke the devil? Who cares about the devil, man? But Michael didn't dare to hand down a judgment against the devil. Instead, Michael said, May the Lord reprimand you. This, this devil seems to be pretty powerful. An archangel won't, won't, won't say a bad word about him. That's not the Christian Satan. Is it? What? You see, it only makes sense when you realize that Yahweh is indeed the one that's been trying to destroy humanity right from the very start. And Yeshua is the one that's been constantly saving us. When Yeshua says, I've come to destroy the works of the enemy, and that somehow destroying the works of the enemy is completing and fulfilling the law, how does that work? Well, now it makes sense. Now, I know if this is the first time you heard this, yeah, I can't accept that. Okay, you're going to have to read the text, because it's all in the text, and you should watch my study, Two Gardens and a Snake. But now we understand why the archangel Michael was arguing with Yahweh over the body of Moses, because Yahweh is the only one who knew where the body of Moses was. And although it's not explicit in the text, it does appear that Yahweh murdered Moses. I mean, either it's incredibly convenient timing that the two of them walk up a mountain together and he shows the promised land to Moses, Look out, this is the land I'm going to give to your ancestors, but not you. You're going to die right here. And then Moses dies, and we don't go, wait, what happened? Why did Moses die? Did Yahweh kill him? It doesn't say that in the text, but it's pretty plain, it's pretty obvious. Yahweh murdered Moses. He's a murderer from the beginning. Right? So, who is the beast in Revelation? Yahweh. Yahweh is the beast in Revelation. Yahweh is the God of this world. Yahweh is the one who's going to introduce the mark of the beast, of himself. Yahweh is going to return and declare himself God and demand that everybody worship him like he demanded everyone worship him in the Old Testament. There's no difference. There's a grand deception at foot. Christianity is not what we think it is. Christianity is not pointing us to Jesus. It's replacing a whole bunch of, of stuff. It's replacing God with the God of this world. And saying that that God of this world, the God of Torah, the God of the Exodus, is the God. No. No, he's the God of this world. We see more in Ephesians 4.4. You can go look at that. I won't, I, we're going to kind of cut this short now and say goodbye. But hopefully this has opened your eyes a little bit. Hopefully you can look at this diagram and I'll make this available right away. Um, You'll just look for it in the comments or in the description of the video or something. Um, you'll find a link 
to this uh, as a PDF, nice high quality for you. Um, and you can kind of sit on this and, and contemplate what's really going on here. So we have a beast that is Yahweh, and who's the second beast going to be? It's going to be a replacement Messiah, isn't it? It's going to be a replacement son. So, very, very soon they're going to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And they're going to start animal sacrifices in the temple. Now, the Temple Institute is at a crazed pace right now to get this going. And uh, we'll see what happens politically. But they're going to build this temple. They're going to start animal sacrifices and grain offerings once again. And then in three and a half years after they start that, the abomination of desolation, the ugly thing that causes destruction, is going to stand in the most holy place. Yahweh. Yahweh is going to come and stand in the Holy of Holies in the new, newly rebuilt Jewish temple. And Jews and Christians are going to fall for this in spades. And they're going to go, Yahweh has returned. Why wouldn't they worship Yahweh? They do today because they think Yahweh is God. They're going to do everything he says. How's he going to deceive even the elect? Easy, because right now they all think he's God. You ask any Christian today, what's God's name? They'll give you some very Jehovah, Yahweh, some might say Jesus. We've been fooled. A massive grand deception, just like Yeshua told us would happen, has come upon us. And Christians on mass are worshipping not the father of Yeshua, but Yahweh. Isn't it funny that Yahweh in the entirety of Torah never even mentions having a son? Why does he call himself a jealous God? We don't see any personality like that from Jesus. When Yeshua talks about his father incessantly in the Gospels, why does he never connect him to the God of the Old Testament? Because Yeshua's father is not Yahweh. Yahweh is the one that has tried to wipe us out for millennia. And his final attempt is here. Before our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, returns and deals with him once and for all, and sets us free. I love Yeshua. He is my whole life. I I hope you've really gotten something out of this this evening. And uh, I'll put the other PDF up here as well, uh, on how you can read the Gospels to recognize the voice of Yeshua. Um, thank you to all of my incredible supporters that are scrolling across the bottom of the screen right now. You people are just absolutely amazing. Someone just sent me a hundred dollars before the show. Thank you. Like seriously. Someone asked me the other day, you know, why do people send you money? Because this is my job. You know, I left ministry and now I guess in some ways, and I guess for real, I mean, I'm in ministry again and My friends are the people that support me. So everyone who's given more than $25 in the last 30 days, their name is on the ticker there. And thank you so very, very much. I appreciate you all. All right. These are difficult things for me to talk about. People that I've spent my life with in ministry have shunned me and turned away from me. Not all of them. But it's imperative on me that I preach Jesus to a broken and hurting world, and uh, I pray that I do him justice. I'm not a prophet. 
I'm not a false prophet. I'm just his friend. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and give you shalom. Join me next Sunday, 7.45 p.m. Eastern or thereabouts for our next non-Christian Bible study. Have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye.